honoring fallen heroes today, the traditional and quiet tributes in San Diego and around the nation as people remember those who died while serving their country. Consumer advocates answer the call for more transparency with the state's Public Utilities Commission. Thousands of emails tracking the agency from San Bruno to San Onofre and the new online tool that helps trace the paper trail. Now it's a sport for anyone. Persistence paying off on the green, the San Diego program that's helping kids thrive at golf and school. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening, thanks for joining us. I'm Eric Anderson. Iraqi Special Forces have started their push into Fallujah, Iraq. The troops expected to encounter the stiffest resistance yet in this campaign to free territory from the Islamic State's group. Video released today by an Iraqi Shiite militia group shows a firefight with Iraqi troops. The Iraqis are getting air support from U.S.-led coalition. The advance is expected to be slow in an effort to minimize civilian casualties. San Diego and the nation honored today members of the military who died while serving their country. President Barack Obama continued a longstanding tradition at Arlington National Ceremony. He laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. This comes as special, special operations forces continue to serve in dangerous missions in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. As Commander-in-Chief, I have no greater responsibility than leading our men and women in uniform. I have no more solemn obligation than sending them into harm's way. I think about this every time I approve an operation as President. Every time, as a husband and father, that I assign a condolence letter. Every time Michelle and I sit at the bedside of a wounded warrior, the president's address remembered more than 1.3 million service members who paid the ultimate sacrifice in service of the nation. There was a big turnout at Fort Rosecrans National Cemetery today where people paid tribute to fallen service members. The activity started before sunrise with 100 volunteers placing thousands of roses on headstones. A Marine Corps band and veterans shared memories of those who fought and died during wartime. Some families use today's events to teach younger generations. They should be honored, and I think it's important, and Melissa and I think it's important that our kids understand the sacrifice that our, our fallen veterans have made for our country. Today's ceremony was in honor of Petty Officer Charles Keating. The Navy SEAL based in San Diego was shot and killed during a firefight with Islamic State fighters earlier this month. The tributes continued in Coronado. Hundreds of people of all ages gathered at Star Park for a solemn remembrance of those who died while serving their country. Our hearts and prayers are with them as we remember with this simple tribute, a wreath, and salute their gallant service to this great land of liberty and freedom. The color-splashed audience that filled this small Coronado Park sported plenty of red, white, and blue. Terry Bucklew was drafted into the service in April 1968 he found himself in the middle of the Vietnam War just a few months later. This place was full today. They were standing in the streets, and, and it's, it, it's really touching to know that we still have a lot of support for the military within this country. Young children came to honor lost parents and grandparents. Military colleagues offered stoic homage as the fallen were remembered. It's estimated that more than 1.3 million American veterans have died in the service of their country. Navy Lieutenant Beth Teach had her hands full keeping track of her energetic son Hunter. And her heart was heavy as Memorial Day observances called on people to think about those who couldn't be here. Unfortunately, we have lost people we've loved, people we've worked with and uh, served alongside. And so we think of them often. We think of many of them every day, but Memorial Day is when uh, the whole community really stops to reflect on that, and it's nice to see so many people come out. First service honoring fallen American soldiers happened in 1866. 
it was a response to the Civil War in which about 700,000 soldiers died. Some unexpected timing for one of the presidential candidates on the campaign trail. As Donald Trump spoke at the San Diego Convention Center on Friday, KPBS reporter Steve Wall says a federal judge in a civil suit against Trump University was ordering the release of key documents. From the stage, Trump took off after the plaintiffs, the law firm, and federal judge Gonzalo Curiel calling him Mexican, though the former prosecutor is from East Chicago, Indiana. The judges in this court system, federal court, they ought to look into Judge Curiel because what Judge Curiel is doing is a total disgrace, okay? But we'll come back in November. Wouldn't that be wild if I'm president and I come back to do a civil case? The class action suit claims deceptive practices by Trump University. The judge ordered the release of so-called playbooks, which outlined how Trump University operated. The case is set for trial on November 28th. According to the judge's order posted on Politico, Curio felt most of the material was not confidential, and the defendant has thus failed to articulate compelling reasons for why the material should remain sealed. Some former students say Trump took their money while instructors taught them little about real estate. The GOP nominee said thousands of former students gave positive evaluations of the course. Curiel gave Trump's lawyers until Thursday to release the documents. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Frustrated voters who feel disconnected from political parties may be responsible for the rise of so-called outsider candidates like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. A new Associated Press poll shows many Republicans and Democrats feel helpless and angry about this election. There are clear partisan divisions when it comes to views about the parties being open to new ideas. Democrats are, more likely, are most likely rather to see the Republican Party as resistant to new ideas, while Republicans are most likely to see the Democratic Party as resistant to new ideas. The Libertarian Party nominated former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson as its presidential candidate. Party members say he has what it takes to challenge Trump and Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton. They point to a poor showing in popularity polls by both major party candidates. I, I tell the truth. I am not a liar. And I make plenty of mistakes, but what I say here at this convention is what I say everywhere, wherever I go, and I believe it is a really libertarian message wherever I go. The 63-year-old Johnson needs to qualify for presidential debates in order to make a serious run this year. That means he must average 15 percent support in five recognized polls. KPBS is dissecting the political messages that are flooding our mailboxes. Reporter Megan Burks continues our Show Us Your Mailers series with a look at this bold claim. Quote, only one candidate led the fight against City Hall's wasteful stadium plan, unquote. It's printed on this bifold mailer. On the inside, San Diego City Council District 9 candidate Georgette Gomez is pictured talking with voters. All of the candidates running to replace Councilwoman Marty Emerald have come out against public financing for a new Charger stadium. So what makes Gomez different? What constitutes a fight versus plain old opposition? Gomez's campaign says she was the first to post her opposition on Facebook. She also launched a petition and sent an email to all of the candidates running for city council asking them to stand against taxpayer dollars for a stadium. And a spokesman says she included the message on every mailer she sent. This isn't about one post or one mail piece or one tweet. Days after the mayor announced his proposed plan to spend $350 million in public money for a stadium. Georgette leapt into action, began collecting signatures on a petition, and since then hasn't stopped. Gomez's campaign did not tell us how many people signed the petition. Gomez opponents Ricardo Flores, Araceli Martinez, and Sara Saez all say she is overstating her leadership on the matter. Saez posted her opposition on Facebook the same day as Gomez, and Flores points out he was advising his boss, Councilwoman Marty Emerald, when she voted against spending public dollars on a stadium environmental study in July. Megan Burks, KPBS News. 
damning documents chronicling the alleged misdeeds of regulators responsible for overseeing California's utilities can now be found on one website. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma says the goal behind making the material easily accessible is to spark reform. Accusations that the California Public Utilities Commission has favored the state's big energy companies over consumers have dogged the regulator. There have been criminal investigations into the commission's handling of the 2010 San Bruno gas pipeline explosion that killed eight people and the San Onofre nuclear power plant closure after a radioactive leak in 2012. Questions have also surfaced about whether the PUC could have prevented the recent Aliso Canyon leak that released thousands of tons of natural gas into the air in Los Angeles County. Now, L.A.-based Consumer Watchdog has created a public searchable website holding more than 100,000 emails and other documents dubbed the PUC Papers. Jamie Court is the group's president. It's really evident from the tone of these emails that on a day-to-day -day basis, the Public Utility Commission is there to make sure that investors are protected, but not necessarily ratepayers. Asked for a comment on the website, PUC spokeswoman Terry Prosper said the emails are the thousands the commission posted online to comply with public records requests. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. Medical officials say some people think HIV and AIDS are worries that people had decades ago. They don't think there's a risk today. KPBS's Maya Treblusi uh, talked with Cheryl Clark, KPBS's partner I News Source, about tonight's news and numbers. Cheryl, thanks for joining me. Let's begin with what you found. Well, we tend to think that education and effective medications have made this epidemic obsolete. But it might surprise a lot of people that in 2014, one new resident in this county was diagnosed with HIV disease or AIDS every 18 hours in 2014. That's 480 new cases that year. That's just slightly more than the number diagnosed in 2013. And people are still dying because of this virus. In 2014, there were 108 people in this county who died from HIV disease, and that was just about a dozen fewer than in each of the two prior years. Not a big drop. And aren't the drugs working? I spoke with Terry Cunningham, who has been in the center of this epidemic since it began in the early 80s, and he's the former head of the Office of AIDS Coordination here. He said that while new medications do work for some people, they don't work for everybody. Some people can't take them because of side effects. They're expensive and not everyone qualifies for discounts or subsidies. And what are the behaviors or risk factors that are propelling the epidemic today and have they changed? Well, the biggest change seems to be an increase in so-called high-risk heterosexuals. Those are people who have sex with someone who is infected or don't use protection. That went from 12.6% in 2011 to 17.5% in 2014. Otherwise, the major risk factor remains men having sex with men. That's 72 percent of San Diego County's 2014 new diagnoses. Cheryl Clark with KPBS partner iNewsource. Thank you. Thank you. You can see more on this report at iNewsource.org. May Grace stuck around for the Memorial Holiday weekend, much to the chagrin of the Chamber of Commerce. But Steph Davis says we should expect a warming trend this week. That's tonight on the KPBS Weather Report. Happy Memorial Day Monday, everyone. Hopefully you're enjoying time with family and friends. Weather not too bad out there. We saw some clouds and sprinkles earlier on in the day, though we do expect conditions to continue to improve, and we'll dry things out as we head towards tonight. Current satellite and radar across the area looking good with quiet conditions from Borrego Springs all the way towards the California coastline. For tonight, we will remain dry in Borrego Springs, just some clouds building in. Your overnight low is 66 degrees. 
degrees. Temperatures in Mount Laguna falling back to the mid 40s tonight. Mid 50s for Ramona and Alpine with a quiet forecast. 60 degrees, your low in Oceanside with a few clouds building in. And we'll see some low clouds tonight in San Diego. Your overnight low is 62 degrees. High pressure strengthening across the West Coast for your Tuesday with a whole lot of dry air in place. So we're looking at a tranquil forecast for the day on Tuesday. Heat will continue to build across parts of Southern California, especially in the desert areas. Here's a look at your five day outlook for the coast. Partial sunshine Tuesday, highs near 70, and a similar weather pattern for your Wednesday. Then we'll see that heat start to build at the coast Thursday. Your daytime high is 76, upper 70s for Friday, and that's also what we can expect at the coast for our Saturday. Five day outlook inland showing partial sunshine for your Tuesday, high temperature 71, and the temperatures will continue to climb as we look ahead towards the late week. 73 and partly cloudy Wednesday, partly sunny, nice and warm Thursday and Friday with highs in the upper 70s, 76 with partial sunshine for your Saturday. Five day outlook across the mountains of mostly sunny and warm Tuesday and Wednesday as highs climb to the 80s. Then we'll break to the mid 80s Thursday and Friday, upper 80s as we kick off the weekend for your Saturday. Wrapping things up with your five day outlook across the deserts, mostly sunny and warm on Tuesday. We're talking triple digit daytime highs, your high temperature 101. Mostly sunny and hot for the midweek Wednesday and Thursday. High Wednesday 104, high Thursday 106. Very hot Friday and Saturday. High temperature 109 and 110 respectively. So please do exercise caution in this extreme heat. Make sure to keep yourself well hydrated, especially in the desert areas for your Friday and Saturday. Steph Davis, KPBS News. Golf is an expensive store, uh, sport that's not exactly known for its diversity, but a program in City Heights is bringing immigrants, refugees, and other low-income children into the game. Now, the sport is also helping drive excellence in school. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero checked it out. If you close the club in more like that, yeah. it's easier to go through. 12-year-old Subair Mohammed is giving golf tips to younger students, part of an after-school program called Pro Kids. You made it in the circle, though. Nice one, though. It's had him out at the links six days a week for four years. He says he's also learned some life skills along the way, especially... Patience and persistence. Because, uh, like, you, honestly, you can't give up on anything. And at the same time, you have to be patient because you can't rush to things, you, you know? Subir recently wrote a report for Pro Kids about how golf is becoming a more inclusive sport. In the old times, mostly rich people and uh, wealthy people wanted to play and, uh, and said that other people, the common people, could not play. That wasn't right, says Subair. Why couldn't kids like him, whose parents are from Somalia, also enjoy golf? In 1994, Pro Kids was founded by Ernie Wright, an African-American caddy, with that idea in mind. He wanted to teach golf to disadvantaged youth, while also connecting them with academic tutors, scholarships, and trips to pro golf tournaments. He fixed up a rundown golf course in City Heights. That's where Subair plays, and his game is getting pretty good, scoring 45 or less for nine holes. Now it's a sport for anyone. The program helped inspire First Tee, an international version that operates under the same principles. Pro Kids became a chapter. The City Heights Golf Course is next to a Pro Kids Educational Center where students can do their homework and get tutoring. More than half of the 1,500 students enrolled at Pro Kids are immigrants and refugees. Subair's mom, Maha Hussein, is a Somali war refugee. She says Pro Kids has transformed her son. My son, he was choppy, he was frustrated after school sitting home. Now he is a very handsome boy. Hussein says her son has lost weight since playing golf daily. She also likes that Pro Kids offers her son some structure while she's working 56 hour weeks as an elderly care provider. And she sees the program's academic support paying off. Zubair is getting straight A's. I think it's a, a brain game. It's, I don't know how it works. But since the kids play now, I felt like they achieve more uh, each side, you know, they've become very smart. Keith Paget runs the Pro Kids program and has a theory about why it works. He says children learn geometry and physics on the golf course. It's all about angles, you know, your swing is an arc. Uh, 
we, we have kids uh, learning how different services affect the rolling of the ball. <laughs> Paget also says golf is the only sport where players must call penalties on themselves. That ball moves and uh, you take a penalty. You call it on yourself. You don't need somebody over here to say you just violated a rule. You're supposed to report that. He says the program operates on a point system in which kids have to earn points to buy golf gear and go on trips. To play golf, they have to get good grades. They have to be good citizens. They have to mentor other kids. Nastejo Ali, a fifth grader whose parents are also from Somalia, recently did her homework at Pro Kids at what's called the Homework Club. She says golf has helped her with her math. You get a number of strokes on a hole, and you need to add it up on your scorecard. And in school, I'm also doing addition, so it helps in school. Her mother, Marianne Ali, never imagined she'd have kids in the U.S. playing golf. Oh my God, I didn't know anything about golf. When Marianne first ran away from her home to escape the Civil War, she hid in the jungle, eating mud and grass to survive. She was granted asylum in the U.S. and sent to North Dakota, where it was snowing. She'd never seen snow before, and the sight sent her into shock. She considered returning to Africa. But then she got a call from a friend. And she was like, San Diego is like Africa. Sam, the raining, you can see the sky, the ground, the grass and everything. She said, oh, you need to come back, you know, come over here. So she moved to San Diego. She'd never seen a golf course before she got here. Now she has five children who skillfully play the sport. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Video journalist Chris Arciaga helped produce that story, which is part of our Global, Na uh, Global Nation reporting initiative with Public Radio International. Pedal to the metal, Lakeside resident Nick Long has qualified for his second Olympics in BMX cycling. He did finish third yesterday at this year's UCI BMX World Championships in Colombia, and that secured his ticket to this year's Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. Cyclists from France and the Netherlands also qualified, finishing before long. An all-female team is racing into the global spotlight. Students from the Rochester Institute of Technology showed off their skills at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. In tonight's Innovation Trail report, Sasha Ann Simmons shows us how it wasn't all smooth sailing on the track. This car is unlike most others on the roads. It has four open wheels, not like a passenger car where it's all enclosed. Um, it has two roll bars to keep the driver safe in a rollover impact, and it has to be powered by an electric motor with high-powered lithium-ion batteries. The electric car is called Hot Wheels. It's the end result of a two-year project built by an all-female group of engineering students at the Rochester Institute of Technology. We have to do all the frame design, the parts design, all ourselves. Positive is always on the right. It's one of those rare moments when the job requires no experience. The students are a mix of different backgrounds and majors who have formed a team out of interest and curiosity to see whether all the research could pay off. We set out to do a two-year design and build phase. The actual design started in January of um, 15 and we went, um, designed all the way through about December and then we really started to build heavily in January of 16. With their eyes set on a major competition, the women put the finishing touches on Hot Wheels in early May. Yeah, Mora. You got this. Next, they were off to the races at the New Hampshire International Speedway. The tilt test is one safety check that ensures no leaking from the vehicle. 30 teams from across the globe put their creativity to the test at the Formula Hybrid, a design and engineering challenge for college students. Hot Wheels passed an initial mechanical inspection with flying colors, but later a close call would put the women in jeopardy of hitting the track. I slammed on the brakes and it was just way too much force in the front and it actually turned this, the bottom and the front suspension twisted over each other so it completely just ripped apart one of our wheel assemblies. She was in the car, I was out of the car so I had a different perspective. I just saw everything crinkle and I was just <laughs> like, oh no. Time was of the essence so the women quickly put their thinking caps on. The mistake cost them a few rounds of the competition. Then, finally, the electric car remained powered up for nearly 12 miles. We came together as a team in those, the rest of that day to really pull together and show that 
we might have had a failure, but we're a team to be reckoned with, and we're going to get back out there. We're not done, and we're here to compete. Hot Wheels' brightly colored technical design won the team third place, and they finished third in the overall competition. But the women say it was a different prize that made this all worthwhile. We actually walked away with two professionalism and like management awards. When things got rough, the team found a unique way to lighten the mood. <laughs> we dance. <laughs> So the, I think they've never really seen that type of an atmosphere before where everyone just gets around the car and starts doing the wobble, but they, um, that's, that's how we build morale. And there's no doubt the hands-on experience created bonds and friendships they will take with them down whatever road they travel. We've seen so many girls, even young first and second years, transform just in this past semester their level of confidence and understanding of things just because of this team. This Innovation Trail report was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, both Democratic presidential hopefuls are counting on union support as they barnstorm California in search of votes for next week's primary. We'll take a look at where union support is lining up in the primary and why. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks very much for joining us. Evening Edition will be back here again tomorrow night at this time. Have a great evening.